explanation of the emotions in both man and animals uh, in terms of evolutionary theory. And, uh, and this um, uh, explanation is basically the one which we still accept, although it has been much uh, elaborated on and improved since the time of Darwin. Uh, and um, yesterday, uh, I was talking about um, psychoanalysis and the tradition derived from that uh, and about the uh, emotion of shame. Uh, Darwin, in his uh, famous book on the expression of the emotions in man and animals, uh, noted acutely uh, that shame was hardwired uh, into the human frame because of the physiology of blushing. Uh, we are all um, kind of uh, hardwired to blush under situations where we feel shame, uh, and, and this is a universal human characteristic. Uh, but uh, the question again is about the nature of shame. It's a contrast with guilt. Uh, we said in the discussion on Monday that uh, there's been a long, long series of uh, debates and discussions about uh, the relative importance of shame and guilt in different cultures around the world. Uh, and the three central lectures in the series are uh, devoted to shame, and I'm going to say something about guilt on Friday. Um, this is not a kind of a reflection, I think, of the uh, intrinsic importance of the subject. Guilt is probably very important or just as important as shame, uh, but uh, the writing on the subject of shame is so much more comprehensive uh, and uh, so much better. There are lots and lots of things to say about shame, uh, whereas uh, the writings about guilt, uh, by, certainly by the historians, uh, tend to be very much concentrated on uh, Western cultures since the Middle Ages. Uh, so there's, there's less to talk about on the subject of guilt. It's not that it's less important. Uh, now, uh, yesterday I was mainly talking about uh, shame uh, as uh, seen by the psycho uh, psychologists and particularly by the, the psychoanalysts. Uh, and I related it to the notion of identity. Uh, and um, Shame and the Search for Identity was the title of the lecture, and it was inspired by a famous book. Uh, but the hero of yesterday's lecture was the psychoanalyst Eric Erickson, uh, who uh, famously developed the notion of an identity crisis in late adolescence when uh, the individual chooses his or her uh, kind of social role takes all those important decisions about uh, what career am I going to follow, uh, should I stay in this country or move to another country, who am I going to marry, all those big kind of questions uh, face uh, people at the end of adolescence. Um, and it's quite understandable that people have uh, crises coming to terms with taking those big decisions. Uh, and the other uh, major crisis which Erickson focused on, which I think is important, although it's been uh, under-researched and, um, and, and not so much written about it, and it's not part of the popular culture, is the integrity crisis, which comes at the end of life when people look back on what they've achieved or what they've done or the extent to which they have managed to live up to their youthful ideals. Um, so, uh, uh, so it was the psychologists who had the main um, flaw yesterday, and in today's lecture and in tomorrow's lecture, uh, I'm going to be moving in the direction of sociology. There's always a, a tension between psychology and sociology. Um, sociology, uh, of course, is concerned with the behavior of people uh, in the mass. Uh, and the general idea is that a social setting um, is an importantly different setting uh, from uh, the individual cons considered in isolation. So the psychologist will be able to tell you about feelings of uh, self-worth and, uh, and self-esteem and that sort of thing um, for the individual uh, considered uh, privately and separately, uh, but uh, when we uh, are wanting to uh, go to the social setting, uh, it becomes a question of interaction, it becomes a question of social expectations, uh, and this makes an enormous difference. Uh, 
Um, you cannot derive um, sociology from psychology, uh, although psychology is, in some sense, a prerequisite for doing sociology. Uh, but somehow that uh, business of interacting with many people, uh, with having a framework of uh, expectations laid down by uh, the previous generation or by, more generally, by vast social groups, makes an enormous difference. Uh, so what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, you'll see it in the slide, is the sociology of warrior societies, um, of, of uh, the sociology of the Mediterranean, and the sociology of Africa. Uh, in all these cases, we have uh, very important uh, studies uh, by uh, historians mainly, but also by sociologists and social anthropologists. Uh, and the point here is that uh, we are concerned uh, with uh, a very uh, complex uh, kind of set of expectations uh, about uh, the fulfillment of social roles uh, centered on the notion of honor. Uh, certain kinds of behavior are regarded as honorable, and certain other kinds of behavior as dishonorable. Uh, and when uh, one does something which is dishonorable, uh, this evokes shame. So uh, there is this general uh, idea of uh, many societies uh, enjoying an honor and shame complex as it is often called, uh, and uh, this is a very important uh, set of concepts. Um, I'm looking at it today uh, in relation to warrior societies like the Vikings uh, and Mediterranean societies uh, like uh, contemporary Greece uh, or historic Catalonia uh, and, uh, and, of course, African societies right at the end. Uh, and um, uh, in, uh, in all these cases, there has been uh, fascinating work done, which I'm going to report on. Uh, and tomorrow, uh, I will look at uh, the honor and shame complex uh, in the context of uh, rather different societies, usually, and rather different periods, because I'm interested in things like nationalism and xenophobia. So that's what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. But today, I'm concentrating on some of the classic ethnographies uh, and some of the classic histories, particularly in the Mediterranean area, because the Mediterranean area is the place where this has been best studied and where we have the most comprehensive uh, information uh, stretching over the longest time period. So uh, let's go to um, the start. Uh, the subject of today's lecture is the honor and shame complex often found in warrior societies, but not only in warrior societies. Um, and the modern study of the subject was initiated in the 1950s by the anthropologist uh, James Campbell, uh, who was a, a, of Scottish descent, part of the famous Campbell clan, uh, and um, uh, he uh, spent I think it was two years in the middle of the 1950s uh, in northern Greece. Um, and there you see him on the left in a picture with one of his informants. Uh, he died a few years ago, so this is taken from his obituary in The Guardian. But I think it's a lovely picture showing you the anthropologist talking to an informant. Uh, and um, the classic book he wrote, he wrote uh, something like, Actually, I didn't check this. I probably ought to have checked this because there may well be books I'm not aware of. But there are kind of three major books by him on the subject. The first one, the most famous one, is this one whose cover is shown on the right, Honor, Family, and Patronage, uh, a study of um, institutions, uh, uh, institution and moral values in a Greek mountain community. Uh, now, the mountain community involved is an extremely interesting uh, community, the Sarakatsani. Uh, and uh, they still exist in substantial numbers. 
Uh, and I will, I will tell you something about them before giving you Campbell's analysis of the honor and shame complex among the Sarakatsani. Um, here we are. Uh, the Sarakatsani are a transhuman shepherd people. What is transhumans? Well, this is one of these technical terms which anthropologists like. Um, they migrate. They basically migrate between uh, summer and winter pastures. Uh, and so they don't have a fixed abode. Uh, they spend uh, the summer in one part of the world and the winter in another part of the world. And sometimes the migra migrations can be very distant. Uh, and in the case of the Sarakatsani, they are. Uh, and they don't respect uh, the boundaries of modern states. Uh, so the Sarakatsani are found not only in northern Greece, but as far north as Bulgaria. Uh, and in fact, some of these nice pictures I've got of the Sarakatsani uh, are from the Bulgarian Tourist Agency. Um, now, uh, the, uh, as I said, they're a transhuman shepherd people who live with vast herds of sheep in mountainous country in Greece and the Balkans. Uh, and there in the picture, uh, you see a wonderful um, a, a group of Sarakatsani women wearing traditional costume. Uh, which is uh, absolutely splendid looking. I have another uh, slide of it. The traditional costume is black and white, with men mainly white and women mainly black. The sexual roles are very strongly differentiated in Sarakatsani society. And on the right, of course, you see the, the woman uh, kind of standing up, and you can see uh, how much is black and how much is decorated uh, in her dress. Uh, the Sarakatsani are the subject of Campbell's uh, uh, three early books and, and a number of papers, but they've also been written about by other people. Um, uh, they are also very evocative accounts of the Sarakatsani given in the writings of some outstanding recent travel writers, such as Paddy Lee Fermor in his book Rumili on his travels to northern Greece, um, and Tim Salmon. Um, and uh, so we actually have a lot of information about the Sarakatsani, uh, and um, uh, they are also wonderfully represented on uh, the internet. So if I have time at the end, uh, I will play you a little um, clip from YouTube uh, showing the Sarakatsani dancing. Um, the uh, thing about Campbell's analysis is basically as follows. This is a society based on very strong family and kinship groups. Uh, everything revolves around um, your identity as a member of a lineage. Uh, so um, these are based on uh, very strong family and kinship groups. The status of a family in the society uh, depends, or depended, or depends still, I think, on its adherence to a traditional code of honor. Uh, and the code of honor is sharply differentiated between the sexes. Um, this requires that men should be courageous uh, and ready to defend the family honor in a fight. Uh, and that women should be sexually pure and always act modestly so as to be above suspicion. Uh, it's, and uh, this kind of dichotomy between the roles of the two sexes is very strong in many Mediterranean societies. Uh, and it's connected with the fact that these are kinship groups uh, where property is transmitted uh, through uh, these uh, kind of uh, lines of descent. Uh, and it's very important uh, that um, the rules should be observed, uh, that uh, everybody should know um, who is who and where they come from. There must be no ambiguity uh, about um, uh, who, uh, 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 which people have which parents. So uh, from that point of view, it's, it's terribly important that the women should be uh, sexually pure, they should be virgins on marriage, and that they uh, should be faithful to their husbands. Uh, so uh, the honor of a family uh, depends on uh, the purity and, in general, the modesty of its women. 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, because uh, these uh, families are fairly competitive and status can be lost, uh, and the loss can be catastrophic, um, it is terribly important also that the men should be ready to defend themselves and defend their families. Uh, so uh, the uh, account given by Campbell in his book, uh, on the one hand, uh, is, is kind of wonderful and uh, sort of inspiring because uh, you know, these are remarkable uh, people uh, in all sorts of ways, uh, but on the other hand, is kind of terribly depressing because an immense number of the men get killed in knife fights. Uh, and, um, uh, and, uh, and, and women kind of also sometimes lead lives which are very constricted uh, because they can't go anywhere unless they've got uh, a male guardian uh, or that they are in a, in a group of women together. Uh, so the, um, uh, so it's, 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 it's an example of a traditional society where the values are very strong, uh, but they have uh, this um, kind of binding and forceful quality because of the honor and shame complex. Uh, and this is true of very many Mediterranean societies. Campbell's book uh, was the first book uh, in a kind of explosion of Mediterranean uh, ethnography, which occurred in the 50s and 60s. It was followed, I think, about a year later by a book on Cyprus uh, by the Greek anthropologist Peristiani, uh, and then a whole series of books on North Africa, uh, on the Middle East, uh, on Sicily, uh, on uh, Northern Italy, uh, on Southern France, and on um, uh, Catalonia and the Basque country in Spain. Uh, so uh, there's now a sort of general conviction that there is a kind of Mediterranean pattern. Uh, all around the Mediterranean, you have these societies in which honor and shame uh, are very important organizing principles. So, here we are. Uh, this analysis was generalized. Uh, honor and shame complexes were identified in many Mediterranean communities. And the idea was used to explain all sorts of uh, different behavior, uh, harems and purda, the Sicilian blood feud and Jordanian honor killings. Uh, if a woman has endangered the reputation of her family uh, in Jordan by immodest behavior, uh, then she must be killed. That is the uh, only way the honor of the family can be uh, restored. Uh, and the Sicilian blood feud explains itself. Somebody who is uh, frightened uh, or lacking in manhood uh, sufficient to uh, take up the cudgels when the honor of the family has been impugned or when revenge is required, um, uh, dishonors himself and dishonors his family. And so we get the Sicilian blood feud, which can be carried on you know, murder after murder uh, over a period of, uh, over a succession of several generations. Uh, the, the blood feud is very characteristic of Sicilian society. Uh, and there are a whole lot of other examples, perhaps less dramatic, um, and, and you find it um, showing up in uh, the uh, mores, the behavior, the architecture. I'm always stunned when I go to Spain or Portugal, uh, particularly the old villages, uh, finding those balconies where you have uh, a kind of wooden trellis so that the women can sit behind and look out without being seen. Uh, the, again, this thing about uh, maintaining uh, the uh, purity of the women. Uh, so uh, it's a, an extraordinary feature of Mediterranean societies, um, and it has many, many ramifications. I'm going to mention just a few uh, before um, giving some sort of uh, general historical overview about the decline or the threat of decline of the honor and shame culture. Um, so, uh, here is one very striking example. Uh, John Dominic Crossan, 
uh, who is a member, a famous member of the Jesus Seminar in the United States, uh, came from a Catholic background, but is uh, now uh, one of the uh, sort of leading uh, exponents of um, a kind of uh, post-Catholic uh, Christianity. Um, uh, has written a book uh, trying to explain uh, various mysterious incidents in the life of Jesus. Uh, and the book is called The Historical Jesus, um, The Life of a Mediterranean Jewish Peasant. Uh, and, uh, and of course, um, uh, one of the things which is very strong in this book um, is uh, the account of uh, the society in which Jesus lived as being a, a Mediterranean society where there was a very strong honor and shame complex. So, uh, all sorts of incidents in the New Testament which uh, kind of readers up till the time of Dominic Crossan uh, kind of failed to understand or failed to twig or sort of took at face value and now get explained. Uh, the women at the well, uh, again, Women are, uh, must be kept under control, must be uh, kept under a, a, situ a situation where there are witnesses all the time. Um, so uh, all those incidents in the life of Jesus are where there are groups of women, groups of women going to the tomb. Why do they go in a group? Because they've got to uh, kind of maintain their uh, public reputation. Uh, so, uh, here we have the application of uh, the honor and shame complex uh, to um, a very uh, classic uh, set of narratives which have been uh, studied uh, in the West for 2,000 years. But before uh, John Dominic Crossan, nobody thought of trying to analyze uh, Jesus as being a member of an honor and shame culture. And there are now actually books, I, I didn't um, bother to take them off the internet, uh, with titles like Honor and Shame uh, in the First Two Gospels, uh, and um, uh, oh, Honor and Shame in the Synoptic Gospels, those, those kind of titles. Uh, and there's a huge amount of uh, work being done on questions of honor and shame, both uh, in the case of the life of Jesus as reported in the New Testament, uh, but also uh, increasingly uh, in the Jewish tradition, looking at uh, the Old Testament and looking at uh, the various uh, other writings which have come down to us, the uh, so-called uh, intertent intertestamentary literature, the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, and of course um, the rabbinic commentaries once we get to modern Judaism. Uh, and uh, here is a, a, an example of uh, this kind of a study. Uh, again, I lifted it off the net. Um, it's a study looking at references to guilt versus shame in the Bible, uh, with the Old Testament marked in brown and the New Te uh, Testament in dark brown. Uh, and you'll see uh, that um, guilt uh, is quite substantial, but um, is uh, absolutely dominated by shame. The re re references to shame are much more frequent uh, in both the New and the Old Testament uh, than uh, references to guilt. Um, and uh, you'll see again the um, kind of uh, uh, growth when you compare guilt and shame, and, and, and it's also particularly interesting to compare uh, the dark uh, level at the top. It's a little difficult to see uh, from this graphic, uh, but it appears that um, uh, Christianity is marginally more shame conscious than Judaism. Uh, and that has uh, been uh, kind of argued uh, in a number of other contexts. Um, so uh, again, this interesting question about the relationship between shame and guilt, which I'm going to return to later. But let's uh, look now at another uh, very interesting historical study. Um, this is the great Spanish historian Juan Caro Baroja, 
uh, there depicted on the left, uh, who traced the transformation of Mediterranean values from kind of simple folk values, and, and perhaps also from Arabic values, because you've got to remember uh, that uh, Islamic rule in Spain uh, lasted um, many hundred years. I think it was about 800 altogether. Uh, and, um, uh, and the influence of uh, the Arabs on Spain is very great. Uh, so um, they had a kind of double dose of Mediterranean values, uh, Mediterranean values from antiquity, uh, and, um, and of course uh, you, there's also the Visigothic period when they get invaded by people from the north, uh, so perhaps uh, those uh, northern barbarian values, which are also perhaps worth saying something about because they're also an honour and shame conception, although a rather different one from the Mediterranean one, um, and then the Moorish uh, conquest and occupation. Um, and the crucial point, however, was the emergence of feudalism in uh, the Spanish Middle Ages, uh, and uh, there is this e extraordinary uh, kind of character, Alfonso X of Castile, uh, known as uh, Alfonso el Sabio, Alfonso the Wise, uh, who's one of those um, kind of legendary kings uh, to whom all sorts of things are attributed. Uh, the, from our point of view, the most important thing about him was uh, that he was a lawgiver, a codifier, uh, and he took um, the various um, uh, codes which he inherited, uh, some of which were basically Roman, some of which were barbarian, the Visigothic Code, uh, and the, uh, the canons of the church, uh, and produced a, a compilation of his own, uh, which was one of the most successful uh, codifications in Spanish history, known as the Siete Partidas, uh, because it's in seven parts, uh, and it's that law code uh, which somehow marks the transition uh, from the old uh, kind of elementary uh, ideas about honor and shame to a rather more elaborate feudal set of ideas. Uh, as I put it there in the top of the slide, uh, it's the transition uh, to feudalism in the form of the society of orders. Uh, this is a technical term uh, which has been used by a number of historians, notably some French historians, Roland Moussnier uh, and company, uh, for societies in which status is regulated by law. Uh, so that um, one uh, is born into a certain estate uh, on the basis of uh, who are one's parents and what their legal status is. Um, of course, uh, the idea of legal status goes right the way back. A huge part of Roman law is concerned with uh, the status of being a slave, or the status of being a free man, or the status of, of uh, uh, being uh, a nobleman, a, a part of the equites. Uh, uh, but um, somehow, uh, the impact of Christianity in particular uh, on Roman society was uh, to dilute uh, that uh, kind of emphasis on status, uh, and, um, and it kind of has to be rebuilt from the bottom up. Uh, in the Middle Ages, and it is rebuilt in a whole lot of European societies. Uh, and uh, so we refer to these societies where uh, status is regulated by law as the society of orders. Uh, the, the sort of official theory is usually that there were three great orders, uh, the orders of the people who fought uh, the orders of the people who prayed, uh, and the orders of the people who worked with their hands. Uh, the theory of the three orders, as it's uh, often called, uh, which emerges in France uh, in the early Middle Ages, uh, but is taken up all over Europe and elaborated on, and was elaborated on by Alfonso uh, X of Castile. 
and so, uh, and, and the elaboration is quite extraordinary. I mean, um, he uh, distinguishes all sorts of peculiar situations in which people can lose cost uh, or can uh, gain cost, and uh, he, uh, it, it's, a, it's a very remarkable uh, kind of picture of the social structure he gives. And Juan Caro Barroja, this great Spanish historian, who was of Basque e extraction, his uncle on his mother's side uh, was the great Basque novelist Pio Barroja. And he was brought up by Pio Barroja in northern Spain, uh, his father having uh, uh, spent most of his time in Madrid. He was actually born in Madrid. Uh, and, uh, and Juan Carlos Barroja was sort of much loved all over Spain. I think the picture I've got there is of him in a park in Barcelona. I'm a little uncertain about this, but it, it looks like a certain park I once went to in Barcelona, so it may uh, uh, maybe my memory has uh, got some kind of cr credibility here. Uh, but um, he was much loved all over Spain, and uh, he wrote uh, extensively on the Spanish social structure and its history, and he wrote also about the history of witchcraft in Spain. Uh, because he, grew, he was brought up by his grandfather in a little Basque village where people still believed in witches. Uh, so, Jocara um, uh, 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 Barroja is the great um, uh, modern authority on the Spanish uh, social structure, historically speaking. Um, and uh, Alfonso El Sabio uh, was, uh, to some extent, his hero. Uh, and he's also one of my heroes, I think, not so much for the Sieta Partidas uh, as for the music he wrote. Uh, he was a very accomplished musician, and I just I, I can't resist the temptation to um, uh, give you um, a little bit of music. Uh, am I getting this right? No, I'm not. Uh, where's my help? Uh, yeah. Press on? Uh, oh, there. Ah, oh, sorry, I'm pressing the wrong thing. Uh, still having, still having problems. Here we are. Just a snippet. Uh, 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 I always think it's extraordinary that we can hear, hear the voices of uh, people from several hundred years ago if we go back and listen to their music. Um, so, uh, a little bit uh, there from um, uh, the, um, ah, right, laptop, yes, good. Uh, from the, the, the music of Alfonso El Sabio. Um, and now I'm going to go to another historian who's made a, a kind of uh, imaginative use of the idea of the um, uh, Mediterranean honor and shame complex. And this is the classicist J. E. Lendon, uh, who uh, recently wrote a wonderful book called Song of Roth, 
showing the importance of understanding Greek concepts of honor, uh, when one is reading the great uh, classical Greek historians, in particular, he provides a marvelous reanalysis of Thucydides, the great historian of the Peloponnesian War. Uh, and so the, the book is subtitled, The Peloponnesian War Begins. Uh, and um, uh, it's, it's, it's an absolutely marvelous uh, piece of uh, imaginative uh, writing. Uh, I can't read you very much, but just to give you the flavor, uh, the book opens with um, a, a kind of skirmish uh, outside the walls of Megara, uh, where the Athenians and the Spartans are uh, kind of having a standoff. Um, and uh, it's uh, and, and from mo the modern point of view, it's very strange because uh, both armies kind of come out uh, and, and sort of stand in front of one another uh, the, uh, until eventually one army stands down. Uh, so it's a question of who blinked first. Uh, uh, or that's what it seems, but it, it turns out that there's more than meets the eye. Um, so. This is what he comments. To us, the climactic encounter between Brasidas and the Athenians on the plains of Megara seems as strange as a confrontation between tribes of hooting apes or a standoff between feathered savages in a faded documentary. Its logic was not that of modern war in all its glistening lethality, but that of drunks in a bar, eyes locked on eyes, shouting, what are you looking at? And inching closer and closer to each other, knuckles gleaming until one drops his gaze and yields the victory. Under the rapt observation of the Megareans, watching from the walls of the city, Brasidas led out his army, arraying it for battle, facing the port of Megara. Out came the host of the Athenians, deploying for battle opposite Brasidas. Time passed. Each side stood regarding the other. Then finally the Athenians filed back within the walls of the port. Brasidas led his army back to camp. And so it was that the Megareans opened their gates to Brasidas and the Peloponnesians because Brasidas had recovered the loyalty of Megara. The Athenians could have attacked the army, uh, but their general chose not to. And the reason Thucydides gives, um, uh, 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 he attributes to the Athenian generals, uh, 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 the reasons he attributes to the Athenian generals are strikingly modern. The generals had accomplished the minimum the Athenians had want them, wanted, sent them to do, taking Megara's port. Uh, taking Megara itself would have been a nice bonus, but placing the city itself in Athenian hands was primarily the ambition of the pro-Athenian Megarian cabal rather than that of the Athenians themselves. The Athenians were somewhat outnumbered and therefore at a disadvantage. But most of all, Athens's generals were committed to force protection, to limiting their own casualties, even at the expense of full success. The army opposed to them, they reasoned, was made up of soldiers from several different Greek states. Even in the event of a defeat by Athens, uh, no one state would suffer crippling losses of men. But nearly all the soldiers on the Athenian side were Athenians, and so, win or lose, whatever casualties the Athenian side took, Athenian citizens themselves would suffer. There was a good practical logic then for them declining to engage the Peloponnesians. Uh, but um, things were rather different uh, from the other side. Um, the Megareans viewed the conflict unfolding before the wars of their city as something far different, stranger and nobler. They saw it as a trial of manhood being performed before them, a trial governed by tacit rules. According to the conventions of classical Greek war, one army might challenge another to battle by drawing up in a fair and open place. Then the other army was expected to answer the challenge by moving forward to attack the challenger. Both were expected to play their different parts like knights at a tournament. The one who thumped the shield of another with his lance to call him forth to fight, and the other who came forth from his pavilion to meet the challenger in the lists. In Greece, such a challenge to battle might, of course, be refused. And many, perhaps majority of cases, such challenges were indeed refused because the challenged state feared a bloody defeat. But refusing to fight was an act of cowardice and proved the challengers braver. And on this occasion, there was, on the walls of Megara, a keen audience to the contest, an audience whose loyalty hung in the balance, an audience resolved to ally itself with the better men. Uh, 
So when Brasidas came forth first and drew up his army in the plain, he was delivering to the Athenians a well understood challenge. To answer that challenge, the Athenians had to draw their army against him and attack. The Athenians drew up, but for sound, rational, modern sounding reasons, they did not advance to fight. And so it was that Brasidas won the contest of manhood, and with it Megara, in a victory without tears. Now at last the gates of Megara flew open, and Brasidas and his captains entered the city and sat down with their friends to make quite sure that the loyalty of Megara would never um, quake again. Uh, the historian Thucydides did not trouble to explain exactly why the Megareans rejoined the Spartan alliance. Brasidas had won and the Athenians declined battle, was all the explanation he needed to give. The Megarian decision arose from a set of assumptions about the ways of men and states that Thucydides knew his ancient Greek readers shared with him. It's today's Western readers who need to be filled in on the logic because to us it is strange and shadowy. The logic of the Megareans was part of the heroic code of the Greeks, always uh, uh, to be the best and preeminent above others was the aim of the heroes of the Iliad. And that aim was passed down the generations into later Greece with only the respects in which an individual sought to excel changing over time. Like our society then, Greek society was competitive, but the Greeks, at least those of the upper classes, whose wealth freed them from want, uh, competed primarily not for money, but rather for honor or glory. Um, worth, they called it, timē, the Greek word. Timē was how the Greeks ranked themselves against each other. To be best was to possess the most timē, which consisted of esteem by others and others' confirmation of one's lofty impression of one's own merits. And let me skip uh, to the crucial thing. Yet the political dimension of timē uh, held danger for one Greek's giving a command to another usually implied the inferiority of the commanded um, in honor. If the commander did not accept the inferiority, the command was an insult, an act of belittlement, an attempt to deprive the commander of uh, Timé by acting as if he were of lesser rank than the person who presumed to give the command. The Greeks had a fateful term for such an insult to Timé, which they regarded as giving rise to much or even most of human conflict. They called it hubris. <laughs> hubris was both the act of insult, whatever the reason for it, and the arrogant disposition that disposed a man to the insult. And it is from this second sense of the word that modern usages of the term hubris derive. <coughs> and so the normal Greek uh, reaction to an act of hubris was overpowering anger, huge wrath, which in turn propelled revenge. Only when revenge was achieved, the theory held, could the imbalance in honor be fixed, and only then did the wrath abate. Very powerful. Um, anyway, uh, uh, so these are examples of um, historians making use of uh, the analysis originally offered by J.K. Campbell, um, uh, although there are parts of Campbell's analysis which I think uh, have never been used and probably should be used, uh, particularly his analysis of patronage. Patronage, you know, is such an important concept. Uh, in various societies, including our own. Uh, and um, there were situations in which um, the offer of patronage or declining patronage did affect honor. And uh, so there's more, again, in those classic books than people are making use of nowadays. But let's move on. Now, conceptions of honor were also important in Northern Europe among Scandinavian Vikings and among the German warrior castes. Uh, and the big question we've got to ask is what caused this type of society to decline? And this is a, a question which I'm going to be asking again tomorrow. And here are some factors which have commonly been invoked. 
uh, for explaining why the uh, society of orders disappeared in most of Europe um, and why, although um, we still have Sicilian honor killings, uh, uh, Sicilian blood feuds and Jordanian honor killings, um, in most parts of the Mediterranean, um, the honor and shame complex is much less uh, marked than it was. Uh, I was very struck last year look, uh, during the Greek economic crisis uh, by, again, um, finding that Greeks were invoking uh, concepts of honor to uh, explain their relationships to the Germans and to other Europeans. Um, uh, now, uh, it, it, but it is a fact that the uh, ancient um, uh, honor and shame complex has declined in most parts of the Mediterranean. And that's perhaps one reason why um, Campbell's study of the Sarakatsani is so uh, strong and convincing, because this being a, a, a primitive mountain people, um, the decline is less marked among them. Um, now, here are some reasons. Uh, changes in religion. Uh, ancient family centers values were already under attack by Christianity in late antiquity. Uh, when uh, men were deserting uh, the uh, cause of becoming a senator or joining the army in order to go and become a monk in a monastery or women were going into a nunnery, this was turning their backs on family values. Uh, and so uh, Christianity was very important in late antiquity in undermining uh, the kind of tyranny of the lineage. And in European history, in the long run, the Protestant Reformation carried this a great deal further. The Protestant Reformation, of course, tended to abolish uh, monasteries and nunneries, but uh, there were other ways in which uh, the uh, Protestants were determined uh, to get rid of what they saw um, as uh, a pagan survival uh, in feudalism, in terms of the code of honor, in terms of things like dueling. Of course, dueling is one of the classic uh, ways in which a warrior society uh, recognizes and protects honor. And, uh, and dueling was steadily uh, abolished in Europe um, uh, over a period of several centuries, uh, lasting, I think, from the 16th till the 19th. Um, uh, and uh, there are various other ways in which the Protestants undermined uh, the uh, code of honor. Uh, one way, of course, was the, uh, the general conviction that, uh, there was a, uh, uh, that the believer was in the direct presence of God. The Protestants did away with the mediating role of the, pri of the priest, and if you were present to God all the time, um, you couldn't hide. Uh, you couldn't um, be reliant on your interaction with other people for maintaining your honor. Uh, the, the, one of the um, kind of things about the honor societies uh, is that you get a certain kind of hypocrisy whereby it's okay to cheat provided you don't get caught. Uh, well, if you're a thoroughgoing Protestant, that's not the case. God will know, even if, even if nobody else does, uh, that you violated the code of morals. So, uh, changes in religion, then changes in economic life, the growth of the cities and eventually the growth of modern capitalism undermined feudalism. Then, thirdly, uh, the growth of modern legal systems put an end to uh, systems of self-defense, litigation replaced dueling. Uh, and uh, this is, a, again, an interesting and complex uh, kind of evolution in the history of law. Uh, but uh, once you get to uh, modern times, uh, reputation is sometimes thought of uh, in capitalist terms, in terms of an asset, uh, which uh, is kind of bankable and, ev and, and can be evaluated. Uh, and therefore, uh, you can sue uh, for restitution uh, when uh, your honor has been impugned and you get the development of uh, laws of libel and slander. 
so uh, the growth of modern legal systems is also part of this. And then finally, there are changes in high culture and political philosophy. And I just mention in passing, because I can't uh, really today go into it. I might answer a question about it if somebody really wants to know at question time. Descartes defended dueling, but Hobbes was virulently opposed to it. So uh, we have uh, all these changes uh, which uh, affected the survival of the honor culture in the different parts of Europe, uh, but um, it survived least uh, in those parts of Europe like Germany and Scandinavia which were Protestant, survived more in Catholic areas, but even there uh, was subject to uh, very stringent attacks by the church uh, as we will see when we come to uh, talking about the Counter-Reformation and guilt. Um, so let's go on uh, to Africa. Uh, in comparison with Mediterranean and European societies, the study of honor and shame in Africa uh, has been little advanced. Uh, there's a tiny bibliography. Um, there's one simple observation you can make, which is made nicely here in this map, uh, is that the survival of ancient African ideas about honor, um, very much along Mediterranean lines, has been affected by the spread of the world religions, Islam and Christianity. Um, and, uh, and here you see this uh, different colors on the map, showing the areas of Africa which are mainly Christian and the areas of Africa which are mainly Muslim. Uh, one needs to say that the founders of the great world religions uh, all were opposed to um, uh, major parts of the code of honor, particularly revenge. Think of Jesus' famous injunction to turn the other cheek. Uh, the same is actually true of Islam, although this is less widely appreciated. Uh, I think because uh, Muhammad um, uh, tended to issue very sort of specific, narrow instructions rather than general condemnations, um, and, and sometimes he, he, he sort of rather withdrew uh, and bulked. Uh, for example, um, he was very concerned about uh, fights between um, his uh, followers on uh, on the lines of people taking revenge. Um, and so uh, he issued stern instructions against deliberate insulting. Uh, and in particular, uh, and this of course is a, a, a sort of fatal decision, uh, he forbade the traditional practice of satiric verse making. So. Uh, the uh, Islam also uh, tried to suppress the um, uh, traditional honor culture, but rather less comprehensively and less successfully than Christianity. Uh, and as a general uh, kind of philosophy, both uh, Christianity and Islam um, favored individualism, which again weakens the whole of the family and the idea of the family honor being uh, an all important thing. But there's one uh, masterly synthesis, one great book on the subject uh, by John Eilif. It's called Honor in African History. Uh, and it's a survey of uh, most of the continent, but is particularly good uh, on West Africa and on South Africa. He actually came out to South Africa to do research in the Cape Archives. Uh, and, and, he's, and he's spent, uh, he's a Cambridge historian, very well-known scholar of African history. Uh, and so there's wonderful coverage of those warrior societies in West Africa, uh, where um, mounted warriors, uh, warriors mounted on horses came out of the desert uh, to establish uh, kind of kingdoms like the Sokoto Caliphate. Uh, and he's good on South Africa. Uh, and uh, it's uh, very remarkable, and I want to uh, finish by mentioning that, uh, in general, he shows that the uh, sense of honor remains strong in African societies, uh, even after colonial conquest, even after Christianization or Islamization. Um, 
uh, just let me read from the, the dust jacket of the book. Um, uh, before European conquest, many African men cultivated heroic honor, which uh, admired the civic virtues of the patriarchal householder, and women honored one another for industry, endurance, and devotion to their families. These values both conflicted and blended with Islamic and Christian teaching. Colonial conquest fragmented heroic cultures, but inherited ideas of honor found new expressions in regimental loyalty, in respectability, in professionalism, in working class masculinity, the changing gender relations of the colonial order, and nationalist movements which overthrew the old order. Today, the same inherited notions obstruct democracy, inspire resistance to tyranny, and motivate the defense of dignity in the face of HIV AIDS. So, wonderful book. Uh, and I just want to uh, mention the, the extraordinary thing that he found uh, in, the, in the Cape archives. Um, he shows that uh, that European uh, transition to uh, kind of litigation in place of fighting also occurred among African converts to Christianity. So in the 1840s, you start getting uh, Christian converts in the Cape province um, taking to the law to defend themselves against various uh, kinds of insults uh, and, uh, and, 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 and libel. Um, and, um, uh, and this is a, a kind of quite extraordinary thing uh, because um, it included uh, defending themselves against the racist slurs offered by white colonists. So, uh, absolutely astonishing, uh, the uh, kind of uh, history of honor in Africa. Thank you. Uh, uh, we're going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to try and um, get the Sarakatsani dancing. Uh, but anybody who needs to leave, please leave now, and then we'll have a little bit of discussion. Okay. Okay. <laughs>
Okay. <laughs> right. -o. Are there any questions? I don't. I'm, oh, um, actually, I think it's a, a wedding celebration. Mm. Uh, but I'm, I'm not sure about that. I should really have done my homework better. I just found it on YouTube last night and thought it looked wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, it's very much a fact. Uh, did you hear that? He asks about a war in the Middle East, uh, and, and he's asking uh, to what extent is an honor an issue between the different faiths. Um, and the answer is yes, it's very much a factor. 